pray that you allow them to sell their home in Cape Coral. We pray, Father God, for Estela Puentes, who's in hospice. Father, that you give her grace. My aunt, who is passing away with terminal illness, Lord, that you just surround her with the comfort of the Holy Spirit, that your presence would usher her into eternity in the coming days, Lord. And we pray for Pastor Joey and Suleika that are on their way to Europe, Lord, to have a vacation to the, their father's homeland in Italy. We pray that you cover them with traveler's mercy and cover them with the blood of Jesus and allow them to have a refreshing, powerful uh, trip, Father God, overseas, that you take them over and bring them back surrounded by your angels and that you bring them back in good health and keep them, Lord, against any... Uh, any injuries, Lord, or any health issues that they might enjoy their travel. Father, we pray, Father God, that your word would not be returned void this morning, that it might be a good seed planted in good hearth that would give forth good fruit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Uh, Wednesday night was a spectacular night, both because um, we were at the baccalaureate service at Westwood Christian. They asked me to speak in uh, the 2000 the class of 2019, my daughter's class, and we were able to take a powerful message to the graduating class. Um, listen to me, they had invited me earlier during the year to speak at their chapel, um, at their Bible class, and um, so I decided to take up the, the topic of sexual intimacy. How embarrassing for my daughter to have her dad come and teach their whole class about sexual intimacy. Um, but we did so in such a way that they would advance into purity. Purity is the power of enjoying sexual intimacy, and the devil wants to ruin that. He wants to ruin that, and so um, apparently it went well with the teacher. He was a little nervous, but then he said to the to the senior pastor and... and uh, ministry leader there at Westwood Christian to have us come back and share at their graduating baccalaureate service, which is the last uh, message that they'll receive before they go into uh, the university and into the world. Uh, that's why it's set up like that. A baccalaureate service is the last sermon to be heard by students before they go out to the real world. The other thing is, um, there was one more thing that happened. Oh, the lieutenant governor, which is a graduate of Westwood Christian, Jeanette Nunez, she's the number two uh, government official in Florida. Uh, Ron DeSantis is the governor, and she's his, the lieutenant governor is her, his right-hand uh, woman in this case, and uh, she's the first Latino lieutenant governor in Florida. So she graduated with my wife years ago. Uh, they were cheerleaders on the same cheerleading squad, and then she would graduate from high school. And she said, I never knew that God would make me number two in the state of Florida, uh, representing Christ, representing the goodness of God. So she was also uh, speaking the night that we spoke. And all in all, uh, we said like this, a learning institution is supposed to teach young people how to be faithful to Christ. Isn't that powerful? Because a lot of times we think that a learning institution has to teach us math and English and history. Yeah, a little bit of that, but a lot of character to keep the faith. A lot of character to stay true to Jesus Christ. And in that, you fulfill God's purpose upon the earth. Um, listen to me. To, to be far from God and to not understand and not... Uh, garner wisdom. The first things that I learned in the Christian faith is wisdom and understanding. Get it with all you're getting. Wisdom and understanding. Make sure that that is, is your pursuit in this world. Uh, a lot of people will perish and go through um, irreparable pain and harm because they departed from understanding and from wisdom. So last week we, we talked about Colossians 1.28. We talked about um, the admonition of the Lord, where it says, Him we preach, uh, we, we proclaim Christ. We want everybody to come to Jesus. If you don't have the Son, the Bible says you don't have the life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have the life. You're not even living. Uh, but he who has the Son has the life, the Bible says. So Him we preach, and we warn every man. So if you've ever been uh, recipient of a warning, um, that is a blessing of God towards your life. Uh, 
Now, the fool is the one who is warned and warned and warned and warned and warned and trouble and trouble and, and back away and, and don't walk and don't take another step and continues forward without regard. A fool is the one that doesn't have uh, warning. I, I'm going to tell a testimony right here because it's very powerful. Uh, about four years ago, I, I own a property in my, Miami. It was given to me by my father early on in my cr uh, career as a lawyer. So you go back 25 years ago, and my dad says, I have a building there, and I have a property. And he tried to sell it three times before I graduated from law school. And he, every closing would not be able to close. It wouldn't sell. And my dad needed to sell it. So when I graduated from law school, he says, look, I, I've gone through this three times. I think God wants to give you this property but you'd have to pay for it. I'll give you it. We paid the down payment. He owned it. If you could pay it um, by the end of the summer, if you start picking up the mortgage payments on this, it's yours. And so my dad would give it to me. So I've had that throughout my 25 uh, years of career as a lawyer. And, and so I've rented out and the rental is what pays the mortgage. So I rent out the property, pays the mortgage. And this guy shows up to rent the property. And it's, it's the founder of Univista Insurance. It's all over Miami right now, uh, Univista. It used to be Estrella Insurance, El Toro Insurance, all these insurance companies. But this is Univista. And when he came to see the property, it's been three months since I wasn't able to rent it because the previous tenant left. And so we had to pick up those bills uh, for three months. And then all of a sudden, this guy who's the founder of Univista shows up. But he doesn't show up alone. He shows up with a young lady He's about 35, she's about 21. And you can tell that they weren't married, but they were married. You'd have to understand spiritually what I saw compared to what he was trying to do. So he says, Mr. Molina, I want your building. And I said, well, let me just tell you one thing. The day you cheat on your wife, you're gonna lose everything. That was my response. And he looks at me and he says, why is the guy saying that? He goes, Mr. Molina, I'm a serious businessman. I have seven franchises of these Univista insurance. I'm going to have number eight with your building. I said, I'm glad because the lawyer that was here cheated on his wife, my previous tenant, and he lost his law firm. So the day you cheat on your wife, the day you lose everything. And again, he looked at me like saying, I want to rent the building. And this guy keeps on talking about adultery. I want to rent the building. And he's talking. And the young lady was getting lividly upset. She was enraged. So he says, I'm going to do it. I said, I congratulate you. I'll talk to you soon enough. Give me the checks and we'll rent out the property. So he left. I left. He calls me back seven days later. He says, could you come to my office? I said, sure, what's going on? He goes, you know that, why were you saying that to me the day I went to rent your office last week? Why were you talking to me about that? I said, because you know insurance and I know family and you're about to get devoured and you were about to lose everything. He goes, you know that that young girl, she was my girlfriend for two years. And as soon as you left, I cut her a large check and I gave her $150,000, and I told her I never wanted to see her again. He was able to receive warnings. He was able to act upon warnings, and he says, could you do me a favor? Can you come to my house and speak to me and my wife? And I said, sure we can. And so I called my wife, and I called Pastor Medieros and Ceci, and we went over that night, and we had Chinese dinner with them as we preached to them about the Lord. What are we talking about here? We're talking about there's some people that have the capacity to adhere to warnings and other people, you can talk to them all day and they continue to walk in their destruction. Amen. It's really powerful because months later, I would, follow, I would find him again and ask him why he never made it to church. If God was so faithful and bringing his salvation, why wouldn't he come to church? He goes, no, I'm gonna tell you the truth. They've told me that churches ask for a lot of money. By the way, we forgot the offering today, Ephraim. <laughs> Ephraim's supposed to remind me. Um, no, listen to me. He says, they told me that if I go to a Christian church, they're going to pass the bucket and they ask for money. So I'm, I'm going to stay away. I said, let me just tell you something just for your mind and reference. It had been three months since I hadn't rented my office. So the day that I went to do business, that was to my advantage to keep my mouth shut and not say anything, I did ministry 
the day I went to go do business, imagine when I'm doing ministry. I'm not doing business. If when I go to do business, I do ministry. When I do ministry, you bet you I'm going to do ministry. We're going to minister the provision of God to the people of God and save them from the snare of Satan. These, now he has 50 franchises in town. So he was able to be a wise man and escape from the snare of the evil one. And so God wants us also to look at Colossians 1.28 and say, we not only proclaim Christ, we preach and we warn every man and we teach every man in all wisdom. What for? Why would God concern himself for with us to have access to preaching, to warning, and to teaching so that we can present every man mature in Christ? We see the picture here of our slide that we've prepared for this sermon, and it shows a little baby. Apparently, the terrible twos, the guy's facing the wrong way. But it's not long before he stands up and starts walking the right way and becomes a man. But there's no sadder day than those of us who have been born again in Christ who become stagnant in our growth. We stop growing and maturing toward Christ. We have named today's sermon, A Spirit That Grows Towards Maturity. If you don't have a living spirit, you have a dead spirit. But now that we are alive in Christ, we need to proceed towards the mark. Paul says in Philippians, we need to move forward in the direction of God. We need to understand in Colossians 1.29, it says, um, we want to present every man perfect in Christ to this end. This is the end of our purpose. I also labor. The end of our work in God is to strive according to God's work, which works in me mightily. There is a synergy, there is a force, there is a power in us that is moving us forward in the things of God. There's no way we could become stagnant. There's no way we could become disconnected and distracted from God doing a work in us. And then we cannot, you know, several times in my career, there were opportunities. I had a client who was very wealthy. He was starting the first Cuban restaurant in Fort Lauderdale. About an hour north of here, it would be called Mi Casa. And it would have Cuban cuisine, the best of Cuban cooking. And we set it all up and we, we made the menus and we painted and we remodeled and restored. And I would make $5,000 additional income. I was already a lawyer. I was a successful lawyer. Now successful clients were asking me to partner with them in business ventures. And the Lord says, if you want the world, I'll give it to you. If you want the glory of this land, I'll hand it to you. You could be one of the wealthiest businessmen, lawyers, or you could live for my glory. You could be my prince. You could be my messenger. And so I called my business partner. I said, listen, the Lord has spoken to me clearly. I can go forward in the business venture. It would be so fun to own a Cuban restaurant in Fort Lauderdale. Pastelitos de guayaba, croquetas, cafecito, cortadito, all these things that just the north of here 25 years ago, there was no access. You had to drive all the way down to Miami. And so uh, I told him that the Lord was keeping me into his purposes. So I chose not $5,000 additional per month. I chose the glory of God. I chose the will of God. I chose the peace and the joy that's invaluable. You can't pay for it. You can't buy it. So these are the decisions we need to make as we grow in maturity. And for some people, they don't understand this concept. Last night I was being asked at the dinner table, how do you do it? How do you make these decisions that are crucial in, in the nick of time? And I said, you have to have receptivity. You have to grow up. You have to not be tossed to and fro from a million things headed in your direction. We had talked many times of Proverbs 25, verse 28. It's really important that we say, whoever cannot rule his own spirit, who, whoever cannot govern his own spirit, whoever cannot choose the direction they're traveling in his own spirit becomes like a city broken down without walls what does that mean you have no protection my friend 
You will be plundered. All the special and precious things God has for you, a city in the old days without walls was open overnight to be attacked by thieves. So why would you not want to govern your own spirit? I, I want to suggest today, uh, the, the sermon is about the toxins that come and attack your spirit will ruin your life. If you don't have a covering, if you don't have a protection in this area of your life, you know, a lot of us uh, protect ourselves for our physical body. You know, we wear our seatbelts, we lock the doors at our house. We do everything to care for our physical bodies and absolutely zero to care for our spirits. We, we, we don't, we're not careful with who we talk to, what we're exposed to, what movies we see. And, and we're, we're out there receiving all manner of attacks on our spirit. It affects our longevity. At the end of life, you will be affected to have suffered things God never intended you to suffer. The Amplified Bible says like this, like a city that is broken down. You, you, you have that mental note, the illustration, a city that's full of ruins. As I, as I walk through Cuba, you see that this is the case. 55 years ago, you see the, the destruction of that, of that place that was, it was so modern and so advanced. A lot of people said 20 years ahead of the United States in its modernization and its in industry. And today you walk through there and it's a devastation of ruins. You see everything has fallen apart and fallen down. Like a city that's broken down, like a city unprotected with walls. Is a man who has no self-control over his spirit. It sets him up for trouble, the Amplified says. A person who you see, and, and you, you be the judge of this, have you seen hard and stubborn people? Have you seen hard and stubborn people? In my law practice, there was a little old man. He came into my practice years ago, and I started talking to him about the Lord. And he says, Joaquin, I went to Vietnam, and I grabbed my machine gun, and I, I just mowed down little children because the children were coming with shoe boxes, and they had bombs in the shoe boxes. She, uh, shoe cleaning boxes and he says I had to kill those young people those little kids that were coming up and we were soldiers they wanted to clean our boots and we ended up having to shoot them in the head and he said to me like this he says God will never forgive me for what I did how many believe that's a lie of the devil Amen. absolutely but it was lodged in his spirit a lot of times it happens with women who go through abortion they're like I did this and I don't think God's going to forgive me and so all these things that come and attack your spirit will produce toxins that will affect your development. So hardened people, stubborn people, rebellious people, all these people that have issues in life, that there's people that come to church and they, they cannot receive any instruction because they have an unforgiving spirit. They were hurt in the past and they said, I'm not going to listen to anybody. Some people have told me, you remind me of your father, uh, of my father. And I said, come here, son. And they said, no, I hate my father. <laughs> they have issues in their childhood that doesn't allow them to be receptive in their spirit. I, I want to garner, there are people who have gone through spiritual um, ceremonies and traditions in, in, in really wicked and dark places. And so now they have a reservation to be involved in a place that is full of joy and peace and revival for their lives. So the spirit inside of man affects a man forever. And, and it keeps you back from being able to receive. First Samuel 1.15, Hannah was struggling with God because she hadn't born any children. She might have thought, maybe God is upset at me. God has closed my womb. And the Bible says that she answered no, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have sorrow in my spirit. The high priest said she was drunk. You might as well be drunk if you have sorrow in your spirit. When you're not governing your spirit and sorrow is so heavy 
that you look like you're um, intoxicated with drink. And she says, I'm not intoxicated by drink or by wine. I just have sorrow in my spirit. The inability to see things clearly when you're intoxicated, when you're living life with a distorted mindset, it affects you, my friend. You're about to get into accidents. There are people that are so intoxicated in their spirit, they walk through fields full of landmines. Imagine a place that says, keep out, landmines. And you're like, I'm taking a stroll. I'm just going to go through this and, and let it be. No, my friend, make sure that you have a wise and learned spirit. Ask God to allow maturity to come in that area because if you allow a sorrowful spirit, you'll be affected. Proverbs 18, 14 says, the spirit of man can sustain him in sickness. So the inner man, if we catch a physical ailment, we can put up with it. We catch a cold, we catch a flu, we catch a fever. We can deal with that. But who can bear a broken spirit? If you allow your spirit to be hit, if you allow, you know, if, if you break your arm, you can repair an arm. If you break your head, they can stitch it up. But if you break a spirit, how are you going to fix that? How are you going to mend the area of your life that will determine your victory or your defeat? Uh, my, my responsibility as a pastor is that you would understand this inner part of life. I know that there's doctors, there's excellent doctors. I know there's psychologists that deal with the thoughts in man's heart. But God has given us responsibility over the spirit. Zechariah 12.1 tells us where we got that spirit. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, said the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and lays the foundations of the earth. Zechariah 12.1, him who created the heavens and created the foundations of the earth also formed the spirit of a man. This God who created all things created inside of you a spirit. Those are the things that I was dealing with when you walk into a situation where you're doing a business deal and you look past the physical, past the emotional, and you see the spirit of a man who's not satisfied with his wife, who's cheating on his family, who's going to lose his wife and children, his business, his resources, going to lose everything. Why? Because he was negligent with his spirit. What, what moves us in a direction to discount the admonition of God and to expose our spirit to plunder, to destruction, to a city without walls? And so here, a man who does not know how to govern his spirit, who doesn't understand that God has formed him a spirit. We were having, um, the other day, I, I was sitting with Gerardo at La Carreta here on International Mall, and we we're having coffee, and I sat down, and I always have my radar. Doo, 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 doo. I'm picking up the spiritual vibes of the people around us, and the man right next over to us on the next table was looking with a glaring view, very confused and very depressed. And I said, I'm not here to have a cafecito alone. It's not, it's not, it's not a lack of divine appointment that I'm sitting here within the capacity to say, excuse me, sir, could I have three minutes of your time? And so I said, do I do it? Do I not do it? You know your pastor? He did it. <laughs> excuse me, sir, could I speak to you three minutes? He goes, look, I'm, I'm very confused right now, and I came out here to be alone, and I have too many thoughts on my brain, and I don't want to be rude, but I really need my time. I said, I know, that's why God put me here. Because what you're thinking, I might have the answer to your trouble. And I was able to speak to him and speak to him. I said, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. And I wrote a book and I, I want you to be a champion. And he was like, you know, what, where'd this guy come from? This, this guy is honing in the spirit, a life in the spirit. And we are the people of God. Our lamp has been lit so that we light and shine for the world. Not allow the world to put out our lamp. Not allow the world to set our priorities. 
A lot of people are in a rush. A lot of people are running, not us. The Lord has formed our spirit. Job 32, 8 says, there is a spirit in man. This is, this is the negligence of parents who feed their children, clothe their children, send them to university, prepare them for the work field, and are negligent with their spirit. They don't attend to the spirit, but there is a spirit in man. And it's that spirit in man that when God breathes, the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. So if you are like I was before I got saved, a total nimcompoop, you just a total negative. You, you can't see anything spiritual. You can't see anything right. The things that are lofty and higher and more majestic. The things that, that are above. The, and I said this. I said to the graduating class, do you understand that the things you cannot buy for money are the things that are most valuable? Then what the hell are you doing going after money? What are you doing? How is it that you set your schedule based on money? You have to be deceived because your highest call is the breath of God in your spirit to give you understanding. And when the spirit of God, uh, the, the, the breath of God comes into the spirit of man and boom, it's not a Cuban cafeteria I need. It's more time with Jesus. It's not the glory of the world I need. It's the glory of God. And my friends, trust me, I'm living the glory of God. Why? Because I decided for it 25 years ago. This doesn't happen overnight. This is not uh, lucky charms. This is not magically delicious. This is choosing to feed your spirit. Now, a lot of people tell me, Pastor, I love church on Sunday, but just on Sunday. I love God, but just on Sunday. I think about God, but just on Sunday. Listen, you're being stripped of your most precious things in life. That God will adorn you like you never thought you would be adorned. That everything you do for God, God will return a hundredfold in your direction. But not if you don't walk in the Spirit. The Bible says, um, walk in the Spirit that you not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're intoxicated in your spirit, you're choosing the things of this world over the things of God. And I know I wouldn't get an amen out of that one. I knew it. I knew I won't get an amen when you are choosing the things of this world over the things of God. Because the lasting things, the glory of this world fades, but those who do the glory of God never fades. It gets richer and, and richer. So if you don't hone in onto your spirit, and I got to hurry up, people, because it's the spirit of man that he's put within you that his gives you understanding. If you're not walking like God wants you to walk, you're away from his breath. You're not choosing it as the forefront of your excellence. 1 Corinthians 2.11, the spirit of man is, is inside of man, and the breath of God gives him understanding. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? How is it that you're living life? What makes us totally weird is that we're not living like those whose lamp went out. I can't have the same desires that I did before the spirit was alive and was being breathed on by God, giving me understanding. And people says, well, how did you make these decisions? Is it not me? It's the spirit of Christ in me. Amen. The law firms were giving me the largest contracts in the city, the biggest law firms. And I said, hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more, no more. Why? I'm walking different. I mean, if I do the same thing the people in the world do, I'm going to end up in the same place. I need to do things so backwards, they think I'm doing the moonwalk. I'm going this way. You guys run that. And many times, I'm, I'm human just as much as anybody else. Say, like, God, are you sure? And then God would say, you want to end up like them? With no wives and no children and child support and desertion? Or you want to end up like one of my princes? You want to end up with my glory. And so I would do the moonwalk all the way back the other way. 
I'm not going to walk like the world. I'm not going to think like the world. In fact, if I'm thinking and acting and walking like the world, I could only expect to get what the world got. I have to have a different spirit, a more excellent spirit that was those Daniels. How could Daniel say, I'm not going to have a portion of the king banquet? It says he purposed, I think it's Daniel 1.8, he purposed in his heart not to participate. Look, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's portion, with his most beautiful delicacies. He would not be intoxicated by the wine. He wouldn't drink. And therefore, he he requested the chef that he might not defile himself. Let me not eat at the table of the world. This is great preaching, by the way, if you never heard it. Absolutely, give a hand to the Lord. How are we going to do the same thing the world does? How are the the yearnings of our soul going to be satisfied with the crumbs that fall off the table of these, what do they call uncircumcised Philistines have no relationship with God and that's what you want? You're going you're gonna to put your children out there to sacrifice them on the altar of stupidity? You're not going to have something different. You're not going to have something different. So my concern is that 1 Corinthians 2.11, who knows the things of the man except the spirit of him that's inside of him? Even so, the things of God, no man... No man could see the things of the Spirit of God, and your spirit needs to be healthy. That's why some of you, unforgiveness, your depression, your anxiety, your worries, the Bible says the cares of this life choke the life of God. We we can't be walking in that mindset. We can't feed that fury. It's insatiable. You cannot worry about tomorrow. Every day has its own concern, and God has it all handled. John 13, 35, by this all men shall know that you're my disciples. You walk in love and not in selfishness. If you love one another, are you doing things that are birthed out of others? No. It's your priority. It's your schedule. You don't have time to celebrate somebody's baptism. You don't have time to, yesterday was a glorious wedding, Sam and Chantel. There's a young couple that did things right, and yesterday we celebrated their union, and now they're off to their honeymoon, and, and they're walking different too because they went through marital counseling, they went through discipleship, they've been faithful, they've honored their parents, they've walked in such a way that has been glorious. But if the opposite of this, by this, all people will know you're not my disciples because you're selfish as hell. You're selfish as the devil. It's the opposite of love. When you're burned by selfishness, you got a toxic spirit. It's funny for me because here's, here's our day. We're, we're traveling our day. We're, I was like, okay, we never do anything for us, Yvette. Yvette, we're going to somebody's wedding. We're going to somebody's baptism. We're going to this. We're, we're, all our life is not about us. I, 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 I trust. I challenge you to find a better marriage than ours. A joyful marriage because it's not based on us. It's not based on want and care. And, and it's the glory of God to be a disciple of Christ is that you love one another. They will know that you're my disciples when you are not selfish, when it's not about you. What are you going to do this weekend? First, I'm going to go do this. Then I am going to go do that. Then I will go do there. And then I and I and I. And you're filled with you, my friend. There's no time for other people. The Spirit of God is not upon you. The Spirit of God gives gives us life for the world and they will know you're my disciples when your spirit is not toxic to needing you me myself and I you're you will be known as my disciple because you're constantly doing things that deny self there's no difference and this is what the bible is saying listen um one young man brought his son to church one day It was the first time he would come to church. And when he left, he says, why was the pastor so angry? I'm angry because you're missing out the glory of God. I'm I'm upset. I want to stir you up to not miss the glory of God. It never fades. 
It never fades. You'll be my disciples when you love one another. When your spirit has that capacity, John 15, 8, herein is my Father most glorified, so that you bear much fruit, so that your land represents the glory of God. You look upon the expanse of the fields, and you have fruitfulness in the purpose of God. You know what you end up when you live for self? The big zero. It doesn't have a return. It doesn't give you a fruitful land. It's a barren desert. You're doing stuff a mile a minute. You're going to be wandering in the desert the rest of your life. You would have lost it. You would be like Ruth's mother-in-law. What's her name? Naomi. Naomi. She goes, call me bitter. Call me Mara. That The Hebrew word bitter. Why? Because I chose to go off to Moab. I chose to take my, my husband and my two sons into the prosperous land of Moab. Then when the time of the visitation came in Jerusalem, the time that the famine turned into glorious fruitfulness, she was zero. She lost her husband. She lost her children. She lost her dignity. And she got back. And she says, call me Mara because I'm bitter. Deep down inside, I chose another priority. Glory, glory, hallelujah to the wives who will not settle for the glory of this world. Amen. That will tell their husbands, I'd rather die than to miss out what God has for us. In our inheritance, in our spiritual inheritance, the world is not going to talk to you like this, my friend. Open your ears and listen. In this my Father is glorified, John 15, 8, that you bear much fruit so that people will see you're my disciples. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before men. Do not think that you're going to compete with the world and walk out different. This week I, I heard this. I couldn't believe it. Simon Cow, American Idol goes to Barbados with his best friend and his wife and starts an affair with his wife's best friend and takes her. They go to vacation, glorious, and his best friend got ransacked and plundered by Simon Cow. Now, he's a fool that would be with an adulterous woman. The Bible says her steps lead to hell. He's a fool he can tell what American Idol is. He can't tell what a donkey is, what a jackass is, what a fool is. But that's the glory of this world. And you're sitting at the table of demons, think they're going to serve you a prime rib, my friend. You're going to get a bone. Fred Flintstone, that's going to be you. You're going to have a bone. Matthew 5, 16. Same way, let your light shine before me. Let them see you're doing things differently. Oh, we don't do that. Why? Because we're not going to end up like you, you fool. We're not going to end up with the same return. You plant the seed, you get the same fruit. Shine before men so they may see your good works and then say God is good. When you choose God, you get God. You don't choose God, you miss out. So David would say, because we all need to say this, Psalm 51.10, and I got to hurry. Lord, create in me a clean heart, a pure heart. And that starts with a renewed spirit within me. If you don't renew this spirit, I can't desire the things of God. If you don't renew this spirit, my heart is infected with the things of this world. If my spirit is not healthy, if it's not thriving for the things of God, if that's not the highest pursuit in my value system, you need to heal my spirit so that I can have a pure heart. This is our prayer today. Lord, create a steadfast spirit in me. Because when I put up the charts, the top 10 of my pursuit, it would be Jesus, then Jesus, then Jesus, and Jesus, and Jesus, and Jesus. When you capture Jesus, the Bible says, Seek first the kingdom of God, everything will be added. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. Now people say, well, you're going to miss out. I go, no, I'm not going to miss out. If I seek first the kingdom of God, all things in Greek means all things shall be added. God will give them to me. I will not be put to shame. 
I will not be, they're not going to say at the end of my life, Joaquin should have owned a Cuban restaurant in Fort Lauderdale. They're not going to say he should have had the best law firm in Miami. They're not going to say that he, listen, what God is doing, much more glorious. Much more reality being served at the table. Lord, create in me a steadfast spirit like the one that was in Daniel. Daniel 6.3. Daniel was preferred above his, those that were sitting at the table. Daniel was distinguished. He was preferred above the governors and satraps, the other people at the table because an excellent spirit was in him. If you don't take care of your spirit, you're not gonna desire the things of God. End of story. The spirit and the flesh are not in the same existence. If you fulfill the lust, you cannot fulfill the desires of the spirit. Your excellent spirit is gone. Psalm 78, 8. That they not be like their fathers. What was our fathers like? They were stubborn and rebellious. A generation that did not have their heart right. A generation that did not set their heart aright. A generation that did not make sure their heart wouldn't miss it. Whose spirit was not faithful to God. If you're not growing in your spirit, if you don't see that little design there, that you're growing in the spirit, you're pursuing the things of God. I know that some of you have terrible twos. I know that some of you will have an adolescence that's full of rebellion and stubbornness and your own ideas and you think you know it all. But I pray that your spirit might be healed this morning. I pray that you desire the things of God above the things of this world. Numbers 14, 23. These people will by no means see this land that I swore to their fathers to give them. These people will by no means receive the things that I swore to their fathers to give them. Why not? Because they have, uh, let's go read that, Numbers 14, 23. This is the last verse, I hope. Certainly shall not see the land. A lot of you are not going to see the land. The things that God has for you, which he swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me will see it. Verse 24, but Caleb, because he had a more excellent spirit. My servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit. My son, my servant Caleb, he has a different spirit in him. And he has followed me 100% fully. He pursued me fully. I will bring him to the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. How many know my children are blessed? Absolutely. You know why? Because I have a different spirit. Not the spirit of this world. The spirit of God. I nourish, I keep, I protect, I, I cultivate. I, I be careful who I don't hang around with people that are playing around with the things of God. About five years ago, a man who's a Christian, who's a con, a con artist for as far as I'm concerned, he says, oh, Dr. Molina, it's nice to meet you. I want to go to Spring of Life. I want to visit your church. I said, uh-uh, you're not coming to my church. Are you crazy? He has captured the heart of so many people, and he's playing religion, and he's a gimmick, and he's, he's playing games, and he's leading a lot of disciples away from Christ. Where, where are you headed and why? And what has enticed your spirit? Lord, create in me a clean heart. Put a right spirit within me. Let me not be stubborn and rebellious. Let me have an excellent spirit like Daniel and Caleb. Let me walk in such a way that I'm following Christ. Galatians 5, 19. The practices of a sinful nature are clearly evident. When you're desiring sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, when you want idolatry and sorcery and hostility and strife, when you have fits of anger and disputes and jealousy and dissensions, when you're into alcohol, when you're into behavior that's not pleasing to God, and all these things that are similar, I warn you beforehand that those who practice such things will never see what God has for them. But the Spirit, verse 22, of the, the fruit of the Spirit is different. It is love, not selfishness. It's a concern for others. It's joy, peace, patience, how we conduct ourselves with kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. To such, there is no law. Let's stand today.
I just pray that this is a word of God for your life that will make the difference. I just pray that God spoke to you clearly and loudly and that the things that are inside your deep spirit would be a breath of God that gives you understanding and not, the Bible says that the love of many will grow cold in the last days. That the word there is a, a breath of earthly existence. Then your pursuit are earthly. Then the things are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life that intoxicate your spirit to desire things that have nothing to do with God. Father, thank you for this day you have made. We rejoice and are glad. Thank you that a good seed has been brought forth through your spirit into the spirit of men and women here at this church. Lord, we will have an inheritance of glorious, untarnished treasure if we choose God if we choose the things of God, the priority of God, the schedule of God. But if we reject the spirit of grace and we treat as uncommon this gift of salvation and the spiritual life, we're destined to be ruined and defeated like the world. We pray that we might be delivered from the snare of the fowler, that you would set us free, us and our descendants, to pursue your purposes and your glory upon the earth. This we pray in Jesus' name and the house of God says, amen. amen and amen. God bless you. Love you in the Lord. Tomorrow is men's meeting at eight o'clock. No, tomorrow's Memorial Day. Tomorrow would take off. Tomorrow, no men's meeting.